1997. Advances in biotechnology were helping people improve their physical and mental abilities to an amazing degree. Provided, of course, they had enough money. A new breed of people was emerging, half human, half machine. And in Detroit, at least, not everyone was happy to see it. I'd just landed a job as head of security at Seraf Industries, a cutting-edge biotech firm. David Seraf himself handpicked me for the job, said he needed me to keep his people safe. My ex, Megan Reed, was one of them. Brilliant neuroscientist, Megan had found a way to make augmentation safe and affordable for everyone. All she had to do was present her research to Congress. But the night before her big meeting, my security measures failed. A team of Black Op mercenaries stormed into Sarah's headquarters, massacring everyone in sight. Three of the mercs were heavily augmented walking tanks. Their mission? Take out Megan and her team. I tried to stop them, but their leader tossed me through a plate glass wall. Last thing I heard as his bullets slammed into my brain was Megan's dying scream. I should have died with her. Only I didn't. High-end military-grade enhancements saved my life. The best augmentation Sarif's money could buy. It took me half a year to get a feel for her. Should have taken longer. But six months into my recovery, Sarif Industries was attacked again. This time, by a radical group of pro-human purists. Violent, militant, and fanatically opposed to human augmentation, they claimed to be members of Humanity Front, a non-profit organization that wanted the UN to limit biotechnology research. The thugs broke into Sarif's factory and found machinists working overtime on a top-secret military augment called the Typhoon. Sarif sent me to retrieve it, and when I did, I found one of the so-called purists next to it, wired with cerebral implants, trying to download its classified specs. Obviously, something more was going on. The Og killed himself before I could question him. Sarif ordered me to dig deeper, so with the help of Frank Pritchard, Sarif's head of cybersecurity, I did. Turns out a second hacker had been controlling the Og's actions from somewhere off-site. Pritchard and I tracked his signal to a secret FEMA internment camp in Detroit. The Black Op mercenaries were there. The same mercs who'd left me for dead six months before. Figured they'd try again when they saw me. It wasn't so easy for them this time. I took out the tank named Barrett, even got him to give me a new lead. A penthouse apartment in China. Of course, we both knew it would be a trap in the end. Hengsha Island, China. Home to a city so crowded, they had to build a second city on top of it. Trying to find clues in Hengsha wouldn't be easy. Lucky for me, I wasn't alone. Farida Malik, Sarif Industries' ace pilot, had lived in Hengsha before. A good person to have on your side. She knew enough about the place to get me around. Malik dropped me in the lower city, close to the penthouse Barrett had told me about. Bell Tower Associates, a private security firm under contract to the Chinese government, had agents tossing the suite when I arrived. Just not for the reason I'd been expecting. Turns out the man who lived there was a criminal hacker named Van Bruggen. The same hacker who'd been remotely controlling the AUG in Sarah's factory. Van Bruggen's panicked decision to force the man to commit suicide had been a mistake. Now his mercenary partners were gunning for him, and I needed to find him before they did. Locating Van Bruggen meant playing nice with the Triads, Hengsha's organized crime lords. They had the hacker holed up inside a low-rent capsule hotel. By the time I found him, Van Bruggen had no qualms giving up the woman who hired him. Zhao Yunru, president of the Taiyang Medical Corporation. According to Van Bruggen, Zhao wanted to monopolize the augmentation industry and had hired black op mercenaries to destabilize her competition. Seraph Industries was at the top of her list. To prove this, I needed to get inside TYM and grab a surveillance hologram off a server. 
I suspected Van Bruggen was hiding something when he told me this. But nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. Megan wasn't dead. She and her four best researchers had been kidnapped. Spirited away somewhere while their kidnappers made it look like they were dead. Desperate to learn more, I confronted Zhao in her penthouse. She claimed to be a pawn in a bigger plan, and hinted at a group so powerful it controlled global interests at a whim. Then she slipped into a panic room and hit the alarm, forcing me to make a very quick exit. I figured Zhao was lying, but part of her confession made sense. David Seraph had been worried about his people. So worried, he'd required all of them to have subdermal locator devices surgically implanted. The GPLs would have been broadcasting the day of the attack. But Zhao sent a single call to Picus, the world's leader in global 24-hour satellite news, and turned those signals off. I needed to fly to Picus headquarters in Montreal if I wanted to learn more. Eliza Kassan, Pikus Communications' first lady of news. Malik thought I was reaching when I told her Eliza was involved in this. The world's most famous news anchor, working with a mercenary hit squad. But when I confronted Kassan in her office, she freely admitted to jamming Detroit satellites the night Megan's team had been taken. Said she's just been following her commands. I suspected she wanted to say more. But Black Op mercenaries showed up, looking to shut us both down. And just like that, the Eliza I'd been talking to disappeared. The mercs were led by an augmented killer I'd crossed paths with twice before. Fedorova. A woman who'd made silence her best friend. She waited for me to track Eliza's transmission to a secret server room underneath the Picus complex, then jumped me from behind. A deadly fight ensued. I made sure she never moved silently again. With Fedorova down, and no one left to keep Eliza quiet, she reappeared. Turns out Picus's first lady of news wasn't a lady at all. She was a sophisticated AI program, engineered to monitor data streams and control what people believed. Eliza told me the Mercs had brought in a humanity front doctor named Isaiah Sandoval to remove the scientists' implanted tracking devices while Detroit satellites were down. She also told me to speak to David Seraph if I wanted to learn more. By the time Malik and I got back to Detroit, tensions between normal and augmented citizens had reached a flashpoint. Riots were breaking out in several cities, and the UN was being urged to intervene. Seraph was trying hard to convince Hugh Darrow the inventor turned philanthropist who'd once been a leading proponent of enhancement technologies to help stop a possible regulatory vote. Sarif had a lot riding on Darrow. Megan's discovery would have given millions of people the chance to evolve beyond their normal human abilities, and at the same time catapulted Sarif Industries to the top of the Fortune 500. According to Sarif, Megan's kidnappers knew this, and didn't want people evolving unless they controlled how it was done. He called his enemies Illuminati, and urged me to keep searching. Determined to do so, I tracked down Sandoval via America's most outspoken augmentation opponent, Bill Taggart, Sandoval's boss and founder of Humanity Front. Sandoval admitted to operating on Megan's team when I confronted him, but said he hadn't removed their GPLs. He'd merely switched them to a different frequency. Pritchard was able to trace one of the signals to China, Malik and I immediately took off in pursuit. Unfortunately, the Illuminati were one step ahead. Ambushed. Shot out of the sky by Bell Tower Associates, seconds after entering anxious airspace. Malik's piloting skills saved me. After a tense and bitter struggle, I escaped into the lower Anxia. The tracking signal I was following led straight to the triads, or more specifically, to the augmented arm of Tong Si Hung, leader of a gang of augmentation harvesters. Tong said they'd taken the arm off a corpse which Bell Tower had left at their door, meaning at least one of Seraph's scientists was dead. Maybe not the rest of them, though. 
Tong pointed me to a port used for human trafficking and helped me slip aboard a bell tower ship. We were sailing to Rifleman Bank Station, a military base in the South China Sea. Bell Tower was holding kidnapped civilians as prisoners there, and using them to perfect the Hyron Project, a human-computer interface that left most of its test subjects dead. My search for Megan would have ended then, if not for a mysterious ally named Quinn. In exchange for my help exposing Bell Tower, he slipped me aboard a second ship headed to Singapore, and an Illuminati-run biotech facility called Omega Ranch. Three of Seraph scientists were there, forced by their captors to create a technology capable of remotely shutting down augmented abilities. Thanks to an emergency recall notice issued by the World Health Organization, millions of people all over the world already had the biochip installed. With the help of the scientists, I tracked Megan to a private section of the ranch. There, I ran into Yaron Namir, the walking tank who'd put a bullet in my brain the first time we met. He'd teamed up with Zhao and was hoping to catch me off guard. But their little ambush didn't work. I found Megan in a suite belonging to Hugh Darrow, the billionaire philanthropist who Sarif had called on for help. Darrow had convinced her to go along with the biochip plan by promising to sabotage the tech. As she was explaining this, Darrow appeared in a global broadcast telling the world that augmentations would be the death of mankind. Then he activated the biochips to prove his point. All over the world, augmented people flew into a killing frenzy. Darrow had betrayed everyone, and it was up to me to set things right. To do it, I had to reach Panchea, a massive installation in the Arctic Ocean. As I raced through corridors built by an all-augmented workforce, I saw death and destruction firsthand. By the time I shut down Darrow's broadcast, I knew the damage he'd done. Still, humanity's future remained unclear. How would the world react to this sabotage? Would people ever regain their faith in augmentations again? What would be the Illuminati's next move? Only time would give us the answers. now, Hansa. Are ya? Well, if I do, McCready, I guarantee you'll never see it coming. Agent Jensen! Am I gonna have a problem with you? No, sir. No reason to assume you would. Good. Because you are the only augmented operative on this team, and I intend to make good use of you. Listen up, all of you. We got a sandstorm barreling down our ass, and we can't afford to make mistakes. We're going after this man, an arms dealer named Shepard. He's ex-Bell Tower, one of the Special Forces commanders who disappeared during the incident. And he's come out of hiding. That cannot be good. It's not. He's selling weapons and military-grade augments to terrorists. This is Aran Singh, the undercover agent who lured Shepard out of his hole. Best you see Interpol's got. 
For three years, he's worked hard to get in tight with the Jin, an Iraqi smuggling cartel that's infected the Eastern Hemisphere like a plague. Last week, our arms dealer sent a message to the Jin, offering to sell them a shitload of black market merchandise dirt cheap. They told Singh to handle a buy. They're not gonna like it when Interpol disrupts their party. Is things cover really that good? It is right now. We need to keep it that way. This is where the deal's going down. A half-finished high-rise hotel that's been abandoned ever since the incident. It's not a pretty picture inside. Let me guess. Most of the laborers were augmented with heavy-duty industrial rigs. So when the incident hit and they all went schizo, things got gruesome real fast. And no one, except for some homeless junkies, have been inside the place ever since. So what's the plan, Director? Singh's meeting Shepard on the ground floor, inside the hotel's main atrium. He sent the bulk of his gin crew to the penthouse levels to secure a vantage point. I want McCready's team to take up positions overlooking the atrium and make the arrest. Jensen, you're going in solo from the roof. My objectives? Keep the gin from joining the party. As far as we can tell, only one route connects the atrium to the penthouse level, a halfway decent elevator shaft, here. I want you to block access to it. Fine, just cut me loose. Do you plan on relying solely on your augments for this one? I'd recommend taking a little hardware, just to be sure. I'm not leaving my six exposed. Give me something lethal. Your call, but Singh's undercover in all this. So watch your fucking sights. What about range? There's lots of wide spaces and high ceilings in there, but a number of tight and constrained rooms too. So it's a crapshoot, really. Never was one to play the odds. Give me something I can use up close. You got it. One last thing, Jensen. Singh said that Jin are using some sort of portable Wi-Fi device to boost communications. He's got a better chance of maintaining cover if you disable it. We'll keep an eye out for it. But aren't we on the clock here? You said there's a sandstorm moving in. There is, and we got the intel on this mission at the very last minute. So we're scrambling a little. If it comes to it, your number one priority is keeping the gin out of that atrium. Copy that. Time to put away your happy thoughts, gentlemen. We're approaching the target building. You're up first, Jensen. Let's do this. Task Force Actual. This is Knife Leader. Engage Hush Drives and descend to Angels 1-5. 